Z03A. Uh, I am Royce Davis. I'm the Recycled Water Program Manager for the City of Boise um, and happy to be here moderating. Uh, the first session today is titled Online Phosphorus Stability Analyzers Qualifying the Risk of uh, BPR Upsets. And the presenter today is Adrian Menetti. I probably said that wrong. Apologize. Um, PhD PE is a principal process engineer at Clean Water Services. Adrian received her bachelor's degree in civil environmental engineering from the University of Cincinnati and her master's and doctoral degrees from the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign. Dr. Menetti has extensive experience in planning, design, optimization, and troubleshooting of wastewater treatment processes. And she's worked at said, nine years at Clean Water Services. And so happy to have her present. And I, we should have time at the end for questions. I'll come back up and uh, we can have a little bit of time to answer questions if we need, so. Thank you. Let's see. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. All right. Thank you for joining me this morning. Um, I do want to just take a second to acknowledge Peter Shower, who is pretty much always working on BioP with uh, with us at Clean Water Services and Skylar Watnick is a, an operations specialist who uh, a lot of this work is some work that she has uh, put time and effort into. So as I am the first Clean Water Services presenter, I get the uh, distinguished honor of being the first to present the CWS overview. Um, we, uh, sir, we are um, serving Washington County, which is a Western suburb of Portland. Um, that is 12 cities and a portion of unincorporated Washington County, over 600,000 residents, and we protect the Tualatin River watershed. And conveniently, that watershed is actually encompassed almost completely within uh, our service boundary, and it is pretty small and it's slow moving. So we've been working with a, an astringent effluent phosphorus limit for a long time. Um, to meet that phosphorus limit among all the other limits that we uh, have to achieve every year, um, we operate two advanced facilities, Rock Creek and Durham. By advanced, I just mean lots more unit processes. Um, and then two smaller facilities, Hillsboro and Forest Grove. So as I mentioned, the Tualatin is small and slow moving. It's driving that stringent phosphorus limit. So our, our limit is 0.1 milligrams per liter total phosphorus on a monthly median basis. Uh, because of the climate it, where we are in Oregon, of course, it, it's a seasonal limit. So it's May through October. There's more nuance to that, but we won't get into it. Actually, more recently in the last three years, we've been operating with interim limits that are at 0.5 milligrams per liter total phosphorus. The reality though is none of that, whether it's 0.1 or 0.5, it actually doesn't matter to, to how we're approaching uh, phosphorus removal and what that means for this presentation. All right, so let's start with the binary, right? Because then when I add the nuance, it maybe feels a little better. Um, when you have to get down to those low levels, like the first thing you can ask yourself is how, what are my options? So we could do chemical phosphorus removal. Um, so we're gonna put alum or ferric in there. Um, it's, pretty reliable. I pretty much know if I put enough chemical in, I'm going to meet that limit. Uh, but as, of course, it's cost intensive, requires trucking, right? We have to manufacture that chemical. It's maybe not the best on the sustainability front. And on the other side of that spectrum is full biological phosphorus removal. Um, so we're asking our microorganisms to do that. It's pretty cost effective. Um, it lets us, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of the OSTARA nutrient recovery process that we operate at Clean Water Services. It lets us uh, gather that phosphorus and turn it into a usable fertilizer. But, which is my nice introduction to stability, it's a biological process, it's subject to instability. And so that's of course the genesis of why we're talking about this on BPR stability is, well, if we want to meet a stringent limit and we're trying to do it biologically, then it's just an inherent part of what we have to think about. So as I've presented this over the years, and it's something, you know, Peter and I have both been at Clean Water Services for uh, nine years for me, Peter longer. Um, as we've talked about stability and BioP, what I have learned is that my definition may not match everyone's definition. So it's worthwhile for you to know when we say stable, what does that mean? The goal is to maximize biological phosphorus removal. And with a stringent limit, what that means is what we wanna see is no phosphorus in that secondary effluent. So you're, this graph is gonna come back. So I'll take a second to present it. So this is just one summer of operation. 
Um, this is from our Durham facility. All the data that you're going to see here is from our Durham facility. Um, the red line is the uh, online analyzer that we operate on the secondary effluent for orthophosphate. And the really nice thing there is, except for a couple of excursions at zero, this is a stable year for us. It's not perfect. We do have some instability, but this is pretty much what we're looking for. All right. So um, just to kind of give you a sense for when I say advanced treatment, what we're doing, biological phosphorus removal, let me just do a, a introduction here to the plants, at least on the liquid side. So both Rock Creek and Durham are operating more or less the same unit processes, primary clarification, um, secondary treatment through the aeration basins and secondary clarifier, tertiary clarification with alum addition, let's just add that in here, um, is really at that point one limit, we pretty much have to do the alum addition, tertiary clarification, filtration to get from, even if we have zero orthophosphate to get out the, all the solids, that's pretty critical for that. Uh, filtration, disinfection. Of course, I started with a dichotomy, but even when we try and do as much BioP as possible, we pretty much are always doing all, some chemical removal for that. So uh, with a 0.1 limit, we're going to be doing tertiary clarification, alum polishing with the 0.5. That's the goal is actually no tertiary alum addition, but that doesn't mean we're not doing alum addition. Uh, a, a very critical tool that we're using, um, even at that 0.5 limit, is to use some alum in the primary clarifiers to kind, man, kind of manage the orthophosphate load coming in. And of course, the heart of that is the biological phosphorus removal. I am going to, these long presentations, I'm going to spend some time defining my acronyms. Um, I'm going to say BioP, I'm going to say BPR, I mean biological phosphorus removal. And of course, that's happening in the <coughs> secondary process. Uh, one of the things that we do at both plants is primary sludge fermentation. So to augment the key carbon that we need to drive the phosphorus removal. Okay. Staying on the 101 theme before we get in. Um, both Rock Creek and Durham pretty much operate the anaerobic anoxic oxic configuration. So uh, anaerobic zone there to drive biological phosphorus removal, anoxic, which with the mixed liquor recycle helps us do denitrification. Oxic lets us do nitrification, uh, carbon removal. And so if we zoom in then on how we're getting our friends, the phosphorus accumulating organisms, PAOs to actually do their work, um, when we put them in the anaerobic zone, what we're asking them to do is take up that key carbon compound, volatile fatty acids, and store it, fat storage, polyhydroxyalkanoate, PHA, right? So we're ask, asking them, hey, store that key carbon compound, PHA. You're going to hear me say that a lot. They're going to break some uh, phosphorus bonds. They're going to release phosphorus. When they get into the aerobic zone, so glycogen is in there. I'm not going to talk much about glycogen. Um, now they're doing the work that we need them to do. So now they're storing phosphorus, they're uh, using that PHA, they're taking up oxygen, and they're reforming those phosphorus bonds. That's really the work that we need them to do, right? They're taking the phosphorus up, and that's what we're asking them to do. Here with that polyphosphate, that stored phosphorus is what lets us do phosphorus recovery later on. Okay, so... You know, if you, if you go back to this like basic 101 level metabolism, um, and, the, and then we've sort of been in the industry over time, the key observation that came not from Peter and I, but those before us is that phosphorus uptake is the useful indicator of BPR health. So if I super simplify this, we have our VFA, it's taken up anaerobically as PHA, and then that PHA is the thing that drives the phosphorus uptake to get the outcome that we're after, which is zero effluent orthophosphate. And so this, the key hypothesis that you're going to see kind of working all the way through here is that that PHA storage is the battery that drives phosphorus uptake. So if you look at this, this kind of basic um, graphic here, this is our data. Actually, Eric Coates helped us develop this data a number of years ago now. But this basic idea is built in every mechanistic model that you're going to use for BioP, which is that the higher the PHA concentration, the higher the orthophosphate uptake. So really the kind of key hypothesis that is why we're always looking at phosphorus uptake and what we think we're looking at is that the bigger the PHA battery, the, the better the phosphorus uptake we have. And as the battery gets lower, we have less phosphorus. So this is the key thing that we're, you know, you're gonna kind of see come back again and again in this presentation is 
A lot of what we're doing is measuring phosphorus uptake as a health metric. And what we think we're measuring really is carbon storage. Um, and then of course, there's lots of things that can disrupt that, right? We have influent variability in VFA loading. We have variability in phosphorus loading. We have competition, nitrate, oxygen, other organisms that look like variability in loading, even if it's not a measurable one. Um, and so this is why, you know, we're really focusing in on phosphorus uptake as a measure of stability. So for the BPR research program, you know, the idea is that we take this fundamental idea, right? So that's the hypothesis. Fundamentally, carbon storage is important to drive BioP. And then we use that idea to translate into something operational. So what's the health metric? And how, where, how can we predict the conditions where we're going to start to see a phosphorus, uh, a BPR upset event? And so that's kind of the first step. And then the last piece is, well, what can we do to mitigate it? So what can we do to address that on the design side for us in the technology development and research group? And so these things are process controls, basin configurations. So I'm going to focus a lot kind of on those top two today in terms of um, what, you know, what we hypothesize and what we measure. All right, I am going to talk about analyzers. I'm sure you've heard us talk about our uh, residual phosphorus uptake. I'm going to start with residual phosphorus uptake because I need to kind of balance the two against each other when we think about phosphorus uptake metrics. So one, one process control to tool that's looking at phosphorus uptake is residual phosphorus uptake. They're batch tests. So we send our interns and our specialists out once a week and they gather a sample from the end of the aeration basin. They walk it into the lab, they spike it with phosphorus in an aerobic environment. And we just look at the rate of phosphorus uptake. So we call it residual because the idea is it's done the work that we need it to do through the basin. And then what's left? How much battery is left? Um, you know, what, what happens if we get a, a spike in phosphorus? Is there room to take it back up? And so, you know, again, fundamentally, we think we're measuring carbon storage, but what we're actually looking at is a health metric, which is RPU. So we've been doing this for a long time. I was surprised when I started looking at years how long we've been doing this. Um, and if you put the RPU on the, on the x-axis here, um, and then you look at the, on the same day, the secondary effluent orthophosphate, what we've seen is that, you know, there's this threshold, um, like around two was kind of the eyeball threshold where we say, well, we're pretty likely to be upset when we measure two. And if we are above two, then it's pretty likely that we're not. And again, Fundamentally, we think we're measuring uh, carbon storage. So now here we're back with that graph where we're looking at stable, a stable period. So online secondary effluent phosphate over the course of the summer in a stable year, 2019 versus a painfully unstable year, 2021. Um, and so then let's layer on the residual phosphorus uptake rate measurement at that same time. And then I actually did this because now this is starting to filter out through the industry. Uh, which is great, right? Because that's, I want to see it, what it looks like across other basins. The, the feedback that's come back is, I'm not actually finding this to be that useful. I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's interesting. Now the question is, well, why? Um, and so I, remember the definition of stability, right? If I look up at this top graph, so these are the years where we're really developing this method. Here's our, you know, threshold line. Here we see, boy, there's like, four weeks of time where we're seeing instability come. Um, here's, a, you know, a couple of weeks of time where we're seeing instability come, but we're living in this higher range here. So we have a pretty big battery stored up. If we compare that to the year where it was pretty unstable, like, well, yeah, it's not useful. All it's really telling us is, well, you're not doing very good. <laughs> Right. And so if you're kind of living in this place where you're like, even here, where like we would say we're stable, but the RPU is still pretty low, like all this RPU at this time is telling us is, well, you're still in danger. Right. And so I just, I think it's important to note, I do think this measurement is useful, but I think it's useful for places where there's a lot of carbon. So kind of things that look more like that stable year. And I think, you know, maybe less so in the unstable year. And so again, I think this is just layering on. So if I take that and I sort out 2019 from 2021, like pretty much what you see in 2021 is we kind of lived in the unstable zone. Um, so it really it wasn't giving us any opportunity for early warning because we were always in the danger zone. All right, so the reason I wanted to present that is because I'm now contrasting it with the online measurement. 
Um, and so this really started out in 2014 with weekly basin profiles, which are functionally in the aerobic zone, a measure of phosphorus uptake. Um, and so what you're seeing, so Durham operates five basins, four of them pretty much look like that. Um, here's our A2O configuration, anaerobic, anoxic, uh, very plug flow, aerobic. I do think that's probably important. Um, we just did weekly profiles through uh, every week through 2014. Uh, this, this percentage through the aerobic is going to come back here in a second. And I have actually presented this before, but I just like to give the background here. So when we put all of those profiles together for all four of those basins, so here's our, our plug flow aerobic zone, the observation that we made is that, well, I mean, when phosphorus is stable, uptake is pretty fast. Again, here's a measure of phosphorus uptake. And as it goes unstable, um, we start to see it like kind of bleed through at the 7B. So we said, well, that seems to be a point that's kind of giving us this binary look at stability, where if it's zero, it means phosphorus uptake is fast. And as it starts to go non-zero, maybe it means phosphorus uptake has slowed down. So we placed, so 7B, it's about halfway through the basin. Uh, we placed a, a Hawk phosphax analyzer in that location in 2015. And so if I take that same graph and I take away RPU and I put in the online phosphorus analyzer, you know, for a long time, it looked like this. So again, here we know we're pretty stable uh, if the analyzer is zero and we just empirically over time observe, well, if it goes unstable, like we do believe that is an indication, it's an early warning. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of empirically the place where our operations analyst has kind of taken this information in and seen that. Now, if I go here again to the year of 2021, unfortunately, what we're also seeing is, well, it's unstable. But what I also observe is that it's increasing. And so there is actually some early warning in this. Um, and so you can get that empirically with your eye, but the, this is kind of the observation where it's like, okay, I can see that there's information here for early warning. And so maybe I can do a step further beyond just like, well, I'm unstable to, can I put some math around this, right? We've been running it for a long time. Let's see if we can pull some risk factors out of this. So that's really kind of what came to this quantifying the risk idea is, can I put some parameters around these observations that go beyond the gut check here? And so, you know, looking at those two things, it's maybe not a surprise that we ended up with two conditions that we're counting. Um, so we looked at data from 2018 to 2021, just the summer periods. And so we what we did is, so the, the key empirical observation is you need to look at the leading edge of the instability. And so for condition A, where we're, we're operating generally stably, we see uh, no secondary effluent bleeding, and we see the online stability analyzer goes non-zero. And it's been, it's been not zero for three days, and then it goes non-zero, and then we ask the question, uh, how many times did that happen and how much early warning did it give? And then if we take that same idea here, can we do a little better job putting a number around an unstable condition? We already know it's unstable. We're not bleeding. So it's non-zero, but it's increasing. And so then the question is, well, how many times did that happen and what's the likely early warning? I should point out the hydraulic retention time in the basin at this time is around 12 hours. So even a day is still early warning. Three days for sure is early warning. All right, so over those four summers, we counted ten, uh, 17 times where we saw that condition A stability. Nine of those resulted in a secondary effluent bleed through, and that happened between two and six days. So median here is, is three days of early warning, right? Which is not huge, but it's not nothing. Um, and so then we just take that simple math there and get around a 50% risk of upset. Um, maybe more so here, if it's the thing that I think is more useful, which again, is just putting numbers around to the gut check that the analyst is doing already. Uh, stable events tended to be 2018, 2019. Unstable was pretty much 2019, uh, 2020, 2021. 139 times we were unstable and increasing. 109 of them resulted in secondary effluent. It happened on average around a day later. So much more likely that you're gonna have an upset condition when you're unstable already and you're, and you're going stable. So, um, you know, which is helpful. Again, you have the empirical piece there, but it's really just kind of giving you a measure of risk. How likely is that to happen? Um, and so we've been running that for a long time, but we've only done it once. 
one basin. We haven't expanded it. Um, it's expensive to buy analyzers and maybe more so it's expensive to run the analyzers. Um, but we did have train five that came online in May of 2020. And so this new basin at Durham looks pretty different. Um, so you still see the A2O process, anaerobic, anoxic. This is the mix like a recycle, very pretty plug flow aerobic. I do think that plug flow piece is important to finding a stability point. And so on paper, if you look at industry rules of thumb, like what you would say is, well, the zones are undersized. And so we, we did at the time we thought was basically right sizing the unaerated zones to get the most stable bio P we can. So the unaerated zones are significantly bigger in train five. The aerobic portion is about the same. And so again, really what we're doing here is just, can we replicate this, right? So we did it once, can we do it more? Is it useful if we expand it? Just a practical tip on basin profiling, doing this at the same time every day is very important. Um, so this is the secondary effluent. This is the diurnal profile when we're unstable and this yellow dot is 915. So that's roughly when we would go out and do the profile. You can imagine if I had sampled at 915 today and 1215 tomorrow and 205, I'm not sure I would have found a stability point. So I just, if anyone's considering doing this, it is, I think, important to do that at the same time because of the diurnal dynamics. All right, so Skylar did a much nicer, prettier graph than I did for her new data. So what you're seeing here is the aerobic zone here. Um, and then each, each, pro, each basin profile that we did through the summer of 2020. Blue is when we were not bleeding phosphorus and red is when we were bleeding phosphorus. And it, pretty quickly your eyeball kind of zones in here like 6C is about the time where we would call this the stability point. It's around halfway through the basin again. And so in 2022, we actually uh, early this year, so we placed a phosphorus analyzer in that location. And so, you know, we're feeling pretty good, but of course the question is, is, is the information coming off this different basin configuration consistent with what we're seeing um, from train run, which we've been operating forever. So here the RPU comes in. So we're, this is a stability analyzer on train one. We see we're stable going unstable. We see the RPU, uh, lucky for us, and this is maybe the one instance this year where it was relatively high and it goes unstable. If I layer in then the AB5 stability analyzer, what we see is it, so this would suggest that we're less stable in AB5, it's getting worse, and then they kind of come together here. So if I put the RPU in that same time frame, like again, we're kind of seeing these two measures of phosphorus uptake, which are measures of BPR health are kind of agreeing. And then when the, the analyzers come together, the RPU also comes together. So this is just kind of giving us some confidence that when we're comparing these two analyzers on two differently shaped basins, they're giving us roughly equivalent information. Um, one question that comes up very frequently, which I think is an excellent question that we should talk about is, so what? <laughs> if you have no tools to manage the instability, then none of this is actually useful. Um, so we do have some tools at Durham um, and actually also at Rock Creek um, to manage this instability. So I'll just take a second to go through those tools. Um, we do primary sludge fermentation, as I mentioned, and the distribution system for that fermentate actually goes individually to the basin. So if we have a single basin upset, we can actually be shifting the carbon loading to some extent to help overcome that. Um, biomass transfer is another actually to use to tremendous effect at Rock Creek. Um, Durham, that system recently has tended to be unstable universally, so it's not as helpful, but I, I'm really happy when I see the folks at Rock Creek see an unstable basin transfer from a stable one and then recover their BioP, um, which is fantastic for them because, I'll just talk about the secondary, Alan, they don't have the ability to trim. So again, we operate with this lower limit or the higher limit. We're trying not to do tertiary clarification. Durham has the ability to add alum at the secondary clarifiers, which is great in an unstable year, except for the fact that it's hard to come back to BioP when you do that. But Rock Creek doesn't have that. Um, and then both plants, again, it's never binary, right? We're doing biological phosphorus removal, but we're still doing chemical removal. So we can um, do some more trim in the beginning there to kind of overcome some of this instability. So all of this, I've talked about a hypothesis that we think we're measuring carbon storage, but I haven't shown you any numbers or other than the one thing there about carbon storage. So just recently, 
um, we're able to take the health metric and then match it to what is actually carbon storage. So we are able to measure PHA in-house at Clean Water Services. So of course I picked the best data to show you that this is gonna be amazing. Um, here, we had a pretty bad washout event this winter at Durham. Um, and so here's the RPU that we were kind of riding around unstable with quite tanked. You know, we think that means we're draining the, the PHA battery. Of course that matches up. Like any real nuanced discussion, like as we start to measure this, more questions are coming. Um, so this is something that we're actively working on, really trying to link that fundamental piece with the, with the health metric. Um, wider research things that we're doing in our BPR program. So we now actually have a geneticist on staff, Blythe Layton. Um, and so some of the longer term pieces, we're asking the question, if we monitor gene expression or who's there, is that gonna give us an early warning? So that's a piece that we're exploring. Um, mechanistic models have always been a tool um, to kind of look at fundamental mechanisms and how they're built in there. But now we're looking at, can a digital twin be a tool that helps us manage BioP? Again, I think, you know, from time scale, like we're pretty actively looking at that fun, those early pieces, these genetic pieces in the digital twin, those are certainly longer term investments. And as always, like really trying to be the grounded kind of on the practical side of like, what can we do? Where are the process control tools? Where are the new configurations that we can bring in to help with this? So to conclude, um, Certainly we're seeing these online stability analyzers are useful at Durham. Um, and at Durham, we're seeing that it's happening about the halfway point. Some extra work that we're doing is looking, Rock Creek actually has three different basin configurations with three different levels of plug flow. So we are looking to see, can we expand this to the Rock Creek facility? But maybe more importantly, I'm interested to see, is this concept more universal? What happens if, as we see it kind of permeate into the industry? So with that, I appreciate your attention and I have no idea how much time I have. If there's question time, let's take it. <laughs> okay. Hi. Oh, um, sorry. I, it is an online uh, version. I can repeat your question or you could go to the mic. <laughs> Ooh, the load. Um, I'm not even going to pretend like I'm conversational with the load. Despite having looked at it pretty often, I'm afraid to quote a number. Do you have a number in your head, Peter? No. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Co concentration wise, yeah. I don't know what that translates to alone. Yeah. Great presentation. And I have just a few questions. One, it's how do you control the alum to the primary clarifiers? Because of course, if you have too much and you reduce the phosphate going into the PNR and then you have yeah. phosphorus limiting condition. And also you didn't talk much about the variability of VFAs. Is yes. it more stable in the implant? How does that play mm -hmm. an impact in phosphorus uptake rates based mm -hmm. on what you've seen? Um, so first question, how is the alum load controlled uh, or the alum dose controlled? So at Durham, it's flow pace. I actually think it's flow pace at Rock Creek as well. Um, and so, but which means it's manual. So they're, they're setting an alum dose. Let's say it's 30 milligrams per liter. The control system knows the flow. It maintains 30 milligrams per liter. The analysts are looking, what's my concentration two days behind? Should I adjust it? Um, well, some of the thing, the next steps on that is uh, we have once tried putting a phosphorus analyzer online in the primary effluent. It was not successful. But that again, running analyzers, especially with filters is hard. We are going to make another run at it. Um, so next year, we're hoping to be able to do a concentration-based alum dose at Rock Creek. So the one of the things we're looking at in the digital twin, again, how can we use this tool? I cringe a little about putting an analyzer in the primary effluent. The, the question that we're asking with the WARF project is, can the digital twin predict the phosphorus concentration and then therefore control the alum? I mean, I'm interested, right? But I caveat that with like, maybe just as much effort to maintain a digital twin to do that, or it could be wrong. Um, but that, that's kind of the two things that we're looking at there. 
Um, VFA variability, I guess I'll talk, let's talk about the instability at Durham. Um, it is inherently variable just on a seasonal basis, right? So even in a great year, um, the influent variability, and I, I'm not going to talk in, I'll talk in not specifics because I'm not conversational. It's rainy early, right? April, May, it's still rainy. It's pretty low. Um, so BioP is always kind of hard in the spring. And as it gets warmer, like most years, we got more VFA than we know what to do with. I mean, mostly. If there's not nitrate in the influent and, or other weird things happening. So this year at Durham, what we saw is basically zero VFA in the influent through like July 15th and one to two milligrams per liter of nitrate. So that's not great for BioP. <laughs> um, Rock Creek on the other hand has had kind of the other direction. Whereas that for a long time, they had a lot of nitrate which made it very hard for Rock Creek to do BioP. Um, through some efforts on the industrial side and, and just some industrial places closing, um, the, their conditions are more favorable. Um, so, so before like the last two or three years, nobody really thought Rock Creek would be able to do BioP very effectively. And actually right now they're knocking it out of the park. <laughs> no, anyway, does that answer your question? No, you first. Because I can hear myself. I mean, uh, so Adrian, I was just curious on the uh, HRT. Uh, when you see some instability, is the uh, are you seeing shorter, longer HRT? Think about you know, carbon storage, carbon cycling. Longer HRT might. You know, I know we know what Peter Dold tells us about anaerobic HRT. Um, uh, HRT where in the anaerobic zone? Yeah. Right, right. I'm afraid. <laughs> um, I'm the new aeration basin has a significantly longer anaerobic HRT. Um, I would have said that that should have given us more carbon and better BioP. Have we seen that? Actually, we have not. In fact, if anything, it's worse with the same SRT. I have to caveat that because the one thing that we did sort of like learn over time is we, we were managing the SRT in a way that meant that the new basin that should have been the magic basin to do all the BioP was really bad. It, but we were running it at an SRT of like 12 days, which was not helpful. So once we got the SRTs in line, um, now here we have a 2.4 times longer anaerobic HRT. It's not translating into the magic bullet for BioP. However, um, if you don't have any carbon in the form of VF, like if you're very carbon deficient, I'm not sure just having more anaerobic zone is just gonna completely take that over. Um, but it is definitely, so SRT is one that we're looking at HRT, right? I mean, like, believe me, we're looking real hard about why is train five not, not as uh, rock solid as we were expecting. I, again, though, I really don't think you can overcome zero VFA and one milligram per liter of nitrate with any size of anaerobic zone you wanna have. So that's not the greatest year to be actually doing that comparison. Am I getting towards your question? Okay. You, you did kind of touch on it, the SRT. So I was curious if you guys mess around too much with the SRT to see where that, if that helps at all. And then also I was wondering about internal mixed liquor recycle for yeah. the uptake. Did you, have you seen any changes or is that a tool that you can use to actually help? No, normally it's not for, for BioP, but right, I was right. curious. Um, so the, the, the one through four of those mixed liquor, I'll start with. So the SRTs, um, kind of lowers better, um, but actually we're, we're not changing that hugely except for kind of as low as we need it to be, but still meeting our ammonia permit limit. Um, and that's the thing that drives the choice of SRT. But the big thing is just trying to get all the basins, even with those big zones to be kind of equivalent in terms of total SRT, because it ends up being huge. If you run at the same aerobic SRT, of course, train five is huge in total. Um, so not really a tool that we're using because we have to manage ammonia, especially right now, it's pretty much zero that we have to put out. Um, the mix like a recycle, we don't have, we, yes, on train five, kind of, we're, we're, we're doing as much as we can on the mix like a recycle. We have a, a mix like a recycle control with a nitrate sensor. 
Um, can I tell you that there's significantly less nitrate in the effluent of train five, even with that, where the others are just constant load? It doesn't seem to be like it's not the magic bullet that's kind of helping keep the RAS nitrate down. But I, I think some of that is just there's nitrate in the influent. Um, so it's something that like that analyzer is there with the control because it's exactly what we thought. Let's, let's do as much denitrification as we can so we can just mitigate the internal nitrate. Um, again, a rough year to be looking at that for the new train because we're, we have this new source of nitrate that we're tracking down. All right, thank you very much for your attention.